Hello, this is James D'Angelo. Today we are going to be jumping into a question that we've discovered in democracy, perhaps even a really big flaw with how American democracy is administered. And because the midterm elections are coming up, and this is so important for ideas, particularly with Congress, we're going to try and get this done by then. And the beauty of this is, even though we see this fundamental flaw with democracy, one that is at the root of almost every problem in American society today, the reform is ridiculously cheap. In fact, we believe that all the problems that we run into can be solved with one single cardboard box. It sounds completely preposterous, but hang in there because this is really easy to understand, but it's really outrageous stuff. So when I was originally developing this video a few weeks ago, I called the video Something Happened in the 70s because almost everywhere I was looking from economists to politicians to newspapers to journals, people were pointing their fingers at some mysterious event that happened sometime in the 70s that precipitated an enormous amount of problems with our economy, our government, and even our social institutions. And because this moment is so crucial, I'm going to run quickly through most of these encounters that I was having. So let's get started. Here we've got just a Wikipedia article on the golden age of capitalism, which it considers to be from 1945 to the mid-1970s. And it says, following the end of World War II in 1945, the golden age of capitalism lasted until the early 70s. Paul Krugman pinpoints sort of this massive rise in debt leading up to the financial crisis to sometime here in the early 70s. Here's Stiglitz, another Nobel laureate, talks about the beginning of government regulation decay. You've got Paul Ryan and other Republicans pointing their finger at this time for this massive increase in government expenditure. You have libertarian Ron Paul talking about the increase in government regulations that makes it more difficult for a free market market to do its thing. You have the scholar Lawrence Lessig who points his finger at campaign funding and he finds the date 1974 very intriguing. From 1974 to 2008, the average amount it took to run for re-election to the House went from 56,000 to more than 1.3 million. So he's found this problem, but he didn't find the cause. He did not find the root. So here's Robert Reich at UCAL Berkeley, and he talks about the great prosperity that began in 1947 and continued in his terms until 1977. And he focuses on this. I mean, this is a big graphic for him, how inequality was at its highest here in the 70s and then just started to drop. Basically, the rich getting much, much richer, the poor middle class losing out. And he says, starting in the mid-70s, a vicious cycle occurred, which created flattening wages, rising debt, and enormous income inequality. Here's Elizabeth Warren, who focuses also on the flattening of wages, in particular males' wages, which began in 1970 and has been flat ever since. And she also focuses on what Stiglitz was looking at, this change in regulations, these very peculiar changes that seem to focus on assisting the wealthy. Everyone's heard about the massive increase in executive pay. Well, here's a graph showing that. And you can see that scorching up and making a big turn also in the 70s. And here you have Thomas Piketty, who's a big celebrity this year because of his book called Capital, which looks at how wealth keeps getting wealthier just by itself without any actions whatsoever. And this is leading to a brand new gilded age. And he too looks at the 1970s as the lowest point of inequality and then sort of a scorching rise. Okay, scorching rise, not something that's kind of delayed and slow, but something that immediately starts jumping up. And you have all these other funny things that happen. The church starts marching into Washington, D.C. to pay for lobbyists to do their thing. And you can see this happening right here, where it sort of takes a turn, a sharp turn in the 70s, and then just shoots up like a rocket And almost everywhere you turn. Here we have incarceration of Americans. Okay, so it increased for a little while and then starts shooting up like crazy. You have this whole concept of the one percenters or even the 0.01 percenters. Everything seemed to be pretty good. In fact, going towards more equality until sometime here in the 70s. And again, like everything else, it's shooting up. And it's really ironic to think of the Republicans who've been presidents since the 70s and their struggles to lower government spending. So here's a chart about the slowest increases in government spending since the 70s. And it's not Reagan. It's not Bush. Clinton did a pretty good job. Obama did a pretty good job. So even though Ronald Reagan and George Bush believed wholeheartedly and really tried to lower government spending, they were having a really hard time doing that. And everywhere I was turning, I was seeing something happening. Union membership in the United States. Here we are, 1970s, and it starts shooting down. Looks like it's kind of at a peak over here, but let's fairly ramp
random fluctuation, but then the shooting down happens over here. And what you're seeing here is really the development of unions. So the whole idea of unions really takes off over here. Everything seems to be going fairly flat and then boom, they collapse. Okay. And remember unions are very important as this idea of separation of powers. So unions are one form of power and you have corporate leadership and government and other types of power. So the decline of unions means that we are losing one form of our separation of powers. And as we spoke about in the previous slide, we may even be losing another form. Presidents are finding themselves more ineffectual than they used to be. And partly because of this, confidence in government over the last 30 to 40 years has fallen dramatically. Okay, so here, Vietnam's going on. Race riots were happening in the 60s. All these seemingly big government problems, but you still have a lot of confidence in Congress and you have a lot of confidence in government in general. And this starts shooting down. It doesn't take a smooth slope. But here we are today where you have a 7% confidence in government, where in the 70s you had 40%. These next couple charts are pretty interesting. This increase of complexity. It's actually a very terrifying increase that also took a sharp turn in the 70s. It's been growing like a rocket ship ever since. These charts in particular are looking at the tax code. Okay, so if you're just going to do your taxes and you have to understand how taxes work, well, there are more and more pages of things you have to understand. All these little lines that might be giving benefits to different groups. Okay, these lines just keep adding up and they've been increasing. <whistles> but this isn't the only increase in complexity. We're seeing it everywhere. Okay, so just when Congress is going to vote on a bill, the bills themselves are growing enormously, okay? So here it's kind of interesting to think about our Bill of Rights. This is our entire Bill of Rights. Here's Article 1 of our Bill of Rights. All articles, fundamental things about our democracy that you can fit all on one page. Well, current bills aren't like that at all. And this enormous growth in the size of the bills really started to happen right around 1970. And here it's discussed in kind of a humorous way where each congressman each year used to have to read slightly more than 2,000 pages of legislation a year. And that number in 2006 has now shot up to 7,000 pages of legislation. Legislation's not easy to read, and there's no congressman that can end up reading it all. And all of this stuff, starting in the 70s, leads to this really outrageous, really terrifying conclusion that came out this year. Okay, so this guy right here who is the main researcher is named Gillens. Okay, and this is his buddy Benjamin Page. And they released a paper this year with this graph that we're going to be focusing on throughout the entire video. And this graph right here is really a measure of all of democracy and whether democracy is working or not. And they've been on Jon Stewart, they've been all over the place just with this one graph. And what they did was they focused on how average citizens felt about policy and how economic elites felt about the same policy being passed by Congress. And the terrifying thing they found was this flat line. And we're gonna explain that flat line right now. This is a terrifying line. And what this means is that if the average people, okay, you go out and poll the average citizens, if they feel strongly against a particular bill that's being proposed in Congress, it will register down here, all right? So 5% of the average citizens are for the bill, 95% of the average citizens are against the bill. What are the chances of that bill getting passed? Well, what they found was that it was about 30%. Now, the opposite. Okay, so if most of the people on the street, you poll them, they're very excited about a particular bill, they really want it to happen. What are the odds if most Americans, the overwhelming majority of Americans, want a particular bill to be passed? What are the odds of that bill passing? Well, that was also 30%. This is terrifying. What this means is no matter what average citizens feel, there is no change in whether Congress is likely to pass the bill. Congress is unaffected by the average citizen. This is powerful stuff. This is new stuff, okay? We didn't have this data before. The opposite, though, seems to be happening with the rich. If the economic elites or the wealthy are really in favor of a particular bill, the odds of that bill passing go up dramatically to 60%. And if the economic elites are really against the bill passing, it drops to almost zero. And really what this says is that it's easier to reject a bill, to stop a bill in Congress, than to actually pass a bill. But it also says that money changes Congress, okay? Rich people do get their say in Congress, and the average citizen altogether does not affect policy at all. 
This is enormous stuff. And what it means is actually kind of chilling. So if you're someone like Ron Paul, what this line right here suggests is that libertarians are right. Government never does anything that respects the people. It's just acting on its own. It's raising money for itself. It's making rich people wealthier. This is really the first and biggest factual support I've seen of libertarianism in my life. If you're a libertarian, this is virtual proof that you've been right and that all the left and all the moderate right have been wrong. Okay, policy does not reflect the will of the people. And it seems likely that since Tocqueville published his book over 100 years ago, we haven't had a better critique of democracy. And we have to start thinking about flashing the little tyranny alert button. Economic elites control this democracy. Okay, so if you are measuring democracy and democracy is responding to the people, this line for the average citizen needs to be somewhere around here. Now, I suspect that in some countries, it may actually be the other way. So it's even worse, right? If you have a dictator who's getting everything they want, well, almost all the laws that are passed are going to be going completely against the people's wishes. Okay, so almost negative. So this is sort of a terrible dictator. This line right here is sort of the ideal. Right now, the U.S. government is at this terrible state, which just says we don't care about the people at all. They don't influence decision at all. Very big problem. Okay, and so if all these government policies are now reflecting the wishes of the wealthy, well, then we should see more wealth and we should see more poverty. Okay, and so you get lots and lots of books claiming this, but they don't see the cause. So here you have this age of greed, the triumph of finance and the decline of America from 1970 to the present. So once again, we see the 70s. And as some people have suggested without knowing exactly where or how that our democracy has been hacked. Okay, so this great thing the founders have developed, it's actually been tweaked in some way so that it's now benefiting only very small numbers of people. So here we have a problem. We have lots of smoke. All these economists, all the politicians are clearly analyzing the problem, but we don't know the source. Okay, so there's a lot of smoke. Everybody pointing to the 70s knows that there's a problem, but where is the fire? And we keep hearing the same things. Well, people are greedy. Bankers are bad. Government is corrupt. Money is evil. You'll never be able to change any of this. And here's Jonathan Rauch in his book, Demosclerosis. And as he suggests, and he's absolutely right, you have liberals blaming conservatives, conservatives blaming liberals. You have populists and business bashers blaming money. And then you have the public, the general public, right? Blaming leadership and then the lack of it. And then as he suggests, there are grounds to believe that none of the above fully comprehend what is going on. And that's really been the problem. We all have something to blame, but we have not found the common cause. And so we really have to be looking for this common cause. And this is something that I've focused on now for a number of years. And when I was looking at the graphs, I started to see something that I recognize from my experiences in biology and in physics, okay? You see something that grows out of nowhere, grows exponentially right away. You have a system that's been influenced by some impulse. Something has been pushed into the system that changed everything. So here's a graph of the growth of the Chinese privet in the South, okay, Southern US. And it was introduced sometime around here, not the 70s, a little bit earlier, and it just took off. And this kind of looks like some of the graphs that we were looking at. Here you have the introduction of the mongoose and the drop of the skinks all similar graphs. And this is a standard S-curve, things that I talk about a lot. You have this lag phase when something gets introduced, then you have this rapid growth phase, and then you have a peak. It's not clear we've yet reached a peak, okay? So the wealth are getting richer, inequality is growing even as we speak. But if we think scientifically, we have to think that there was some impulse, some change here that led to all of this because it just would be completely unusual that all these different things would take off in the 70s for different reasons. There must be something that was introduced in the system that created these problems. And if you go down to the Florida Keys, you talk about invasive species, one of the most colorful ones is the lionfish which has been multiplying like crazy in the waters near the Gulf. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find this invasive species that has changed all of government. So we'll call it the search for our lionfish, right? Our lionfish of the 1970s. And so I started to focus and direct my attention to something that happened in the 70s, tried to find this invasive species. At the time I started to focus on this idea, I was living in Africa and it's a phenomenal place, right? You really get a different view of how democracy works. You get a really different view of how almost everything works, okay? My wife is Ugandan, 
I love Africa. But while I was there, from 2008 to 2012, there were a number of elections. There was a very famous one in Kenya, which led to a lot of violence, and then the follow-up elections and all that. Every time these elections came about, the government was complaining that they might not have enough money to run the elections. When I first saw this, it caught me by surprise. I had never considered the cost of running an election, and indeed, it's pretty expensive. You have to set up all the voting booths, you need security, you have to print up ballots, and you have to organize the whole system. These are very expensive undertakings, but this didn't mean that elections in the developed world were cheap. Um, so here you have an article in the UK complaining about the price of running these elections. It turns out they're very, very expensive. So being in Africa, I started to think about, wow, they've all got these cell phones now. What if we could do some form of e-voting, electronic voting? I started to look at the tech of trying to solve this problem. And here's some great graphics of people getting all excited about voting electronically. You have companies that are developing electronic voting systems. And the dream is, is that everyone could just wake up on election day, get their hands on a phone, and they could just vote. And that's when I started to really bang my head with some of these problems that I had never really considered about democracy. And I ran into the million dollar question. Here we have this lady. She's stepping out from a curtain. She's inside a voting booth put up by the state so that she could vote. I was going to replace this with someone voting at home on a phone. I really had to start to think about why we needed voting booths. And this pushed me harder into something that I even held more dear, okay? I am a big fan of transparency, transparency in government, all the transparency you can get. I've always thought more transparency, the better, until I started to jump into this. And the question that I started to face was, can we get too much of a good thing? Are there situations where you have too much transparency and it actually starts to put things at risk? And the answer is yes. And really the only place where transparency becomes a problem is when it comes to voting. There are two huge problems where transparency confronts head on democracy and the ability to vote. And if you're a democracy expert, if you're someone who's really into this stuff, pause the video and see if you can think about these two major problems because these two major problems change the game. They really need to be understood so we can understand transparency, elections, and democracy. For those of you who don't feel like pausing, we are jumping forward, okay? The first big problem, and these are under the headline of electoral fraud. So problem one is the idea of intimidation. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Say you're voting at home, and the issue is on domestic violence. And if you're polling women in the street, most of them are for this bill, and they're for putting all these perpetrators into jail. But at home, what you have is the guy is sitting there, the woman sitting there, and she might be voting right in front of the guy, right in front of the guy who's beating her. Is she as likely to vote for this bill that will put the perpetrator in jail, or is she more likely to vote no because he's sitting right there willing to punch her? Okay, this is a major problem. If someone's voting, it's very hard for them to vote their conscience if someone's sitting over them watching them vote and they can be intimidated. So it's very hard to imagine voting at home with issues like domestic violence or some sort of control that affects these families at home. But you have to think that some people might be forced to vote from their business. And the boss of the business might insist that he is watching as they're voting, or he might even somehow figure out some way to get a hold of their phone and do the voting himself. Okay, so this is dangerous stuff. And this is a common and well-known problem, but known for thousands of years, okay? This idea of intimidation. And we can take it one further because this really happened in the United States. A lot of the voting before 1890 was done where the person would just walk into the courthouse and they would say who they were voting for. Okay, so the people recognized all the people in the town and the townspeople would come in and they'd say who they're voting for. The deputies or the people working for the town were there writing down the votes. A lot of times you might even have the sheriff there, right? Making sure that the votes are done well, making sure that everything's conducted well. But you have a problem here, right? Because what if you're voting for the sheriff? Now the sheriff is watching you vote for him or not vote for him. Say you don't like the sheriff. Say you think someone else should be in his position, but say he's likely to win. Are you gonna stand in front of him and say, no, I won't vote for him, or I'm voting for the other guy, knowing full well that you might need the sheriff in a few weeks to help you with the situation at your ranch? Well, if you voted against him, then you call him and say, look, I need help, sheriff. I need help, there's real problems here. Someone's stealing stuff from my barn. Is the sheriff as likely to come? So just by vocalizing your vote, by being public about your vote, you've set yourself up for some situation 
where intimidation could happen. And so you get a lot of incumbency power based on this one concept of electoral fraud called intimidation. And it's really easy to think of myriad ways where intimidation can happen. So that's problem one, intimidation. The other problem is just as big. It's the other big reason why you need voting booths. And the other problem is vote buying. Okay, and most Americans, we don't even think about it anymore, right? Because since the 1890s, there's been voting booths mostly everywhere. We open the curtain in some private situation and we vote. But it turns out that studies on vote buying show that vote buying from the beginning of our democracy all the way up until the mid 1930s was rife. Okay, some studies suggest that in the 1930s, where they didn't have secret ballots, over 5% of the population was being paid to vote a certain way. And most of us just don't think much about vote buying, but it is because of vote buying that you will never get a receipt when you vote. Okay, so this is something you've never seen before and you've never been handed. Some sort of notary has now said that you just voted for Ron Paul and you've walked out of the voting booth and you now have proof of how you voted, not only for the president, but maybe for all these local elections. This has never happened to you. And there's a reason for that. This has been studied and understood perfectly. If you can show how you voted, it is much, much easier to sell your vote. Imagine a guy who runs up to all these kind of homeless guys or guys who need food or something like that. And he says, I'll give you 20 bucks for every receipt that shows that you voted for me. This has real value, the ability to sell a vote. If someone votes in a voting booth and is not hand a receipt, suddenly they can't prove that they voted. And it makes it much harder for the guy with a lot of money to show up to these guys and say, hey, I want you to go over there and vote for me. All of a sudden, the value of their vote goes down in price because they have nothing to sell. Because he could pay these guys to go to the voting booth, but in the privacy of the voting booth, they can vote against them. They can take the money and they can vote against them. So the value and ability to sell their vote goes down almost entirely if they cannot prove how they voted. So the ability to prove how you voted really increases your ability to sell your vote. Okay, so if you're gonna sell a vote, you want a receipt, you want some sort of proof of how you voted, okay? And this is why you don't get a receipt. You leave the election office and they just go, thank you for voting, or maybe put a sticker on your shirt saying you voted, but they don't give you any proof or confirmation of who you voted for. This would be really handy. It'd be really great to have receipts if we had to do a recount. Everyone could pull all their votes together and show who they voted for, but it's been understood for thousands of years that you can't do this. As soon as you provide receipts, you end up with massive electoral fraud and vote buying. Okay, and so the same situation, as I was trying to develop this sort of electronic voting, can happen right here. Say this is your boss. You're voting in your office. He could whisper him like, hey man, vote for me. I'll buy you some drinks. Vote for me. I'll give you a raise. And right here, he can see exactly who this guy voted for. Even though this guy in his head says, my God, my boss is terrible. But he's now in a position where not only can he be intimidated, but he can also sell his vote. So if he's thinking of making cash or getting that raise, well, he'll say, yeah, I'll vote for you, bingo, right there. Now give me the raise, I showed you the vote. And so any time where you have someone who's voting and someone who's watching, you have a problem. That is why when you go to vote in a couple days that you will vote in person, in a private environment. You won't have your husband there, you won't have your boss there, you won't have your friend there. Okay, so if the electoral committee is doing a good job, they won't let you go, hey, I just wanna bring my friend with me while I vote. They'll say no friends allowed. Okay, you have to go alone. Of course here, there's all types of other forms of electoral fraud where you can hack in and change votes and all that. That's a problem in almost any electoral system. That's something to watch out for, whether you're voting in a booth or not. So yeah, you can have electoral fraud from hackers, but that doesn't change the necessity of someone voting privately by themselves. No one can see how they voted. And what's crazy is I had to relearn this. I forgot about this when I was looking at electronic voting. It's something that we should know. Okay. So we teach secret ballots in the first grade. Here's some first graders, second graders, third graders, all voting with secret ballots, right? Putting their folded vote in the box. High schoolers talk about it. They do projects on it, right? The secret ballot, why it's so great, how it began in the United States and completely took over. Wikipedia nails it. They talk about this electoral fraud clearly. There's no exceptions, right? So here you have intimidation. Here you have vote buying. And here you have Wikipedia's and everyone else's solution at preventing this. The secret ballot 
in which only the voter knows how individuals have voted is crucial part to ensuring free and fair elections. So it's a crucial part for democracy. Because if you don't have free and fair elections, you don't have democracy. Before the secret ballot, it was common for candidates to intimidate, threaten, do whatever they could, or bribe by votes. It was common. It was everywhere. The secret ballot cured it. And again, as I hinted at before, it is not new. Aristotle was implementing ways to do a secret ballot 330 years before Christ was born. These are some of the devices that Aristotle was playing with to make a secret ballot happen. And he discussed at length how to work this process. So even if people were able to see someone voting, they weren't able to see how they voted. And this was even before Aristotle, right? So people were talking about secret voting in Athens long before Aristotle. All right, and our government agrees. There's really no counter arguments. Here's Congressman John Klein, right? Secret Ballot Protection Act. Labor's law, secret ballot, protects the vote in Virginia. And here where they talk about a secret ballot, this will make it harder for labor leaders to intimidate workers, okay? Be it for joining a union, for joining anything. If you have a secret ballot, intimidation is really, really difficult. There is no good counter argument to the secret ballot. It's just better. And that is why since the 1890s, the United States and most of the world has upgraded. They used to walk in and do a voice vote or they used to say who they're voting for. But now everywhere we vote, everywhere I voted in my lifetime, be it a bake sale or the PTA, it's a secret vote. No husbands, no friends, and no receipts. Private. Only you know how you voted. So everywhere we vote, we vote is private, except for one place. Okay, so in the U.S. government, in all of our democracy, there's one place where secret voting doesn't happen. And it's almost as if we've had this collective amnesia, right? Everything in 1789 was open voting, and we slowly changed everything. But we've forgotten to really deal with it in one particular place. And some of you already have guessed what this place is. The U.S. Congress, okay? The center of our democracy, the most vital point of our democracy, votes in broad daylight. They vote in public, okay? And a lot of people are going, oh, that's great. I know how my congressman votes. Well, we're gonna look at that and see the real problems with that idea. And <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting there in Uganda and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the absolute outrageousness of this, right? They're hiding in broad daylight. They're voting in public. Every single vote by a U.S. congressman is tallied and publicized and put online, and you can count every single one of them. And we can just hop online, right, governmenttrack.us, and see how every congressman voted for everything, right? Here's Bradley, recent bill. He said yes, all right? Here's the people who voted against the bill. Every single congressman's name and every single vote, public. And sure, I mean, this happened back in the day, right? They didn't know any better. So here we can go back to March 1st, 1799, look at any particular bill on the same website, and we can see how each of our congressmen voted, right? There were a lot fewer congressmen back then, so here's how they were seated, 13 to 17 against. We can see how this happened. So we have a problem, right? We suggest that something happened in the 70s, right? So is this my lionfish? If everyone had been voting this way all along, is this really the dramatic change that Robert Reich is talking about where we get enormous income inequality? Is this what Paul Ryan is suggesting, the enormous increase in government expenditures? Can we blame it on voting if this is the way that Congress always voted? Well, maybe we can, because when I started to look at the 70s, I didn't have to go very far until I found this unknown bill. All right, this is a bill you've never heard of, certainly one you've never read. This bill is called the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970. Okay, so legislative, you know, who's the legislative group? That's the Congress. They're going to reorganize how Congress does their stuff. And it was proposed sometime, I think, like in April, but it passed on October 26, 1970, affecting these changes. And it's really hard to find information about this act. There's almost nothing. People saying, oh, this bill passed, or a little graphic showing some of the bill, but there's no discussion on this bill. This is going to be brand new to you, and this is going to be brand new to the public discourse about what happened in the 1970s. And here's one quote, though, that's kind of interesting. By far, the most significant anti-secrecy provision in the act dealt with the disclosure of House members' votes in the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole is kind of this weird committee where Congress gets together, and in the old days, before 1970, 
voted privately. So they did lots of committees of the whole to avoid public voting. But in 1970, that was changed. If you're in the committee of the whole, your votes can and most likely will be recorded and put on governmenttrack.us. Every single vote, every single congressman. And so this quote elaborates, the House often makes its most important policy decisions in that committee. But for 180 years, its precedents had forbidden the recording of names in these votes, private voting. They still did yeas and nays where they stood up and voted, which isn't very good, right? It still, as we know, needs to be private, secret ballot. No one knows how you voted. But for 180 years, its precedents had forbidden the recording of these names of these votes. Under the new rule in 1970, each member's name and vote was to be recorded. Seems like such a subtle change. Seems like it might even be a good thing. To celebrate the event, they also introduced this in January 23rd of 1973. It was like $800,000 to install these electronic voting machines. Okay, because voting and actually doing roll call voting where you put the name next to the vote, even in 1970 after they passed the bill, wasn't used that much because it took so long. So what they normally did was just have everyone get up who was saying yay, everyone get up say nay, and they kind of go, well, the yays are much bigger than the nays, the bill's passed. If it was close, of course, they'd start counting and they would count heads, but they wouldn't record everyone's names. Now, because of this bill in 1970, they wanted to institute electronic voting so you could have votes that would be quick and precise. Every single congressman's name. So this device would sit at their desk, they'd insert a card which identified them, and then they would press their buttons. Yay, nay, and then there's other options, but these are the most common ones, right? Green for yay, red for nay. And here's a couple different pictures of the devices as they've kind of changed over the years. As soon as they press yay or nay, this would be recorded publicly. All the other senators, all the other congressmen could see these votes, and then they would get published online. And I'm a big fan of our founding fathers. I thought they did an amazing job, but they completely dropped the ball on voting procedures. They completely dropped the ball on secret ballots. Okay, they didn't talk about them. They didn't institute them. They didn't fully understand them. Even though Aristotle and others had been developing for a while, it just wasn't currently in vogue in France and England where they were looking to build their democracy. And this, as we'll see, has led to some problems. Okay, so it was acceptable to vote publicly in 1789. It was acceptable to walk in front of the sheriff and say whether you're gonna vote for the sheriff in 1789, but not now. We know better. But what's crazy is since 1970, no one's spoken about this problem. How could no one even mention the possibility of election fraud these days? I mean, our congressmen, they've studied democracy, right? They're lawyers, all these people. No one is mentioning this. How could no one argue for a cardboard box? And why am I saying cardboard box? Because it's the cheapest little secret ballot box you can create. So for five bucks, a little piece of cardboard, maybe paint it white, put a little flag on it, and you can buy this pre-made kit online. So cheap. Okay, so you can put them up in Congress, get rid of those crazy electronic machines, and have everyone voting privately. And I think it's important to harp on this. It's not that we don't do it, it's that no one even talks about doing it. Okay, so this bill in 1970 was passed 326 to 19, without one congressman suggesting that you need secret ballots or you need private votes, okay? It didn't happen. There was no conversation of people going, this is absolutely horrible. This will destroy our democracy. So whatever you feel right now, it should at least be understood that there's been no discussion on this. So no one discussed it in the 70s and no one has since. No discussion, no op-ed piece in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, nothing anywhere. And what's crazy is you have dozens of scholars, democracy scholars, scholars in general, PhDs, doing studies on roll call analysis. So they take all the votes of all these congressmen, all senators, who try and correlate it with how the average citizen's thinking, how the wealthy's thinking, how specific groups are thinking. They're doing all this analysis, all this data. Books have been written about this, right? So these are dozens of studies on roll call votes. <sighs> all these guys did it, and not one of them in any of the studies go, maybe this is wrong. Maybe all the problems we're thinking about can be erased with a cardboard box or a secret ballot. And the common consensus is, I like to know what my congressman's doing. I like to see my plumber do the plumbing. The more I watch, the more I can control and make sure they're doing the right thing. And this is pretty true, right? It's nice to be able to see what those congressmen are doing, but keep in mind that every group on earth wants to see that. 
and most of those groups have more influence than we do. And as Gillen suggested with his famous flat line, right, it's likely that the people watching the vote are having no effect on it at all, and wealthy groups are having a big effect. So unfortunately, as we spoke about with domestic violence, sheriffs, and vote buying, elections are the one place, and perhaps the only place, as a big fan of transparency speaking here, where transparency could be deadly. You've opened up your democracy. And so strangely, Kennedy, who died before 1970, spoke about this possibility of opening up the vote. And he was completely against it for a reason we haven't dealt with. What he saw was that if you open up the vote of the congressman and made it clear to everybody, this transparency would turn congressmen into seismographs, right? He was very scared of how polls would now force a congressman's hand. If the people notice that their congressman's not voting exactly the way they want as a group, then they're going to knock him out of office. And what Kennedy said about this, his words are very eloquent, okay? The voters selected us in short because they had confidence in our judgment. So again, think about the plumber. He knows how to do the plumbing. He studied plumbing. So you actually hired him to do the plumbing, right? You don't really want to do it yourself, especially if you don't know anything about plumbing. So they had confidence in our judgment and our ability to exercise that judgment from a position where we could determine what were their own best interests as a part of the nation's interest. So remember, he's correlating local interests to nation interests, current interests with future interests. He's looking at long-term stuff, all these things that individual populations are not very good at. And we've seen problems with referendums, right? California went crazy with referendums where this direct democracy and the people would vote without a congressman deciding and they were destroying the state. They made the state almost go completely bankrupt for the very reason that people will ask for more services so they'll vote for more services but then they'll turn around and vote for lower taxes, right? And all these things compound and you end up basically with a really messed up government. And so he's suggesting that you need a representative democracy because these people understand and think about these issues much more than we do. So here's our little menu, right? We've got what Kennedy recommends and we have what the founders recommend, which is a representative democracy. We've got the current system, which doesn't respond at all to the average citizen and responds only to the economic elites. So this is Gillen's line and shows the real dangers of transparency. And then we've got this third possibility, which would be direct democracy, where you just get rid of the congressman altogether and the citizens vote directly on the bills. Trouble with this is they're not only not writing the bills, but the average citizen isn't about to read 2,000 to 7,000 pages of legislation and really understand it. So this is why the founders really recommended some representative democracy. We have people specializing in government trying to represent our interests. Elections just aren't as simple as we'd like to think. We end up with this crazy menu depending on how we choose to do things. But the data is showing that if you want government to respond to the people, you're better off with direct democracy and representative democracy. And the worst solution is this middle ground solution that we're doing. This is the real tragedy. This is why we have all the graphs and all the craziness starting in 1970s. Gillen's found this data, this is new data this year, and a cardboard box solves this problem and allows us to reclaim our democracy through true, old-fashioned, what Madison intended, representative democracy. So in summary, Kennedy was afraid of opening up the vote because he was afraid of the polls. He was afraid that congressmen would just have to respond to every whim and wish of the people turning congressmen into seismographs. So he was against opening up the vote in Congress. Regular citizens currently are afraid that loss of transparency, so closing down the vote in Congress would create fraud in Congress. But we now know that both of these points are moot. Gillen's flatline shows that we're in the worst of all possible worlds. By opening our democracy for us to see, for the citizens to see, we open our democracy up at the most sensitive spot for election fraud, for intimidation, for vote buying. And we subject our government to the interests of the wealthy. And we'll see later that groups and organizations don't even have a choice. They have to go to Washington now to compete in this free market for regulation. Okay, indeed, we open it up for both forms of electoral fraud. Okay, and all we're going to do now for the rest of the video is just give you evidence. So this isn't just theoretical. There is so much evidence from convictions to statistics to analysis, everything you could imagine, every type of voter fraud has been happening in Congress. Okay, so the first form of evidence we're going to get started with is motivation. 
So let's get started with the evidence. Okay, the amount of money that's getting chucked around is enormous. So here's the finance industry and who they're throwing money at, and these numbers are enormous, right? 3,700,000, 3,055,000, 2,700,000 for individual congressmen going in their direction, helping their campaign. Here's oil and gas, all right? And you can go to the site, opensecrets.org, and you can see this for all these industries with lots of money. And keep in mind that this is the money that's declared, the money that we see. There are cases where congressmen were just getting cash and putting it in the freezer in one incident, right? And here we see it in terms of total lobbying spending in the billions. Enormous motivation for fraud. Okay, and we'll continue. There's so much motivation, right? Remember, congressmen make 174000 a year. That's not enough to run a podunk campaign. They need millions to run their campaign, so they need this help to stay in office. They know that, we know that, so the motivation is very strong, right? Money wins elections, money most congressmen don't have. Now, the return on investment, so say you invest in lobbying, turns out to be provocatively powerful, all right? So the return on the amount of money spent by lobbyists to modify the American Jobs Creation Act of 2004 and create a tax benefit basically changed the tax code for that one particular group, the return was 22,000% on investment. That's a pretty good ROI. But what they're saying right here is on average, for every dollar spent lobbying for tax incentives, the return is six to $20, okay? So a 600 to 2,000% ROI return on investment. So if you just put money into lobbying, what it returns you. And that's why we see lots and lots of companies putting money into lobbying Congress to get things for their individualized corporation to get kicked back from paid for by the taxpayer. So from the contributor's perspective, from these lobbyists' perspective, it pays to pay. So there's motivation to put the money in and there's a lot of money in and it's increasing. And each year it's gotten harder and harder to win your election. You need more and more money. And we're starting to see the enormous commitment, the amount of hours they have to put in. So there's articles, the call time for Congress, call time is when you're actually on the phone trying to raise money. It shows how fundraising dominates the bleak work life of a congressman. Every day they're doing something to raise money. Now some congressmen say they're putting in five hours a week, but some are putting in much more. And it turns out that almost all their activities in some way are involved with being good to the money. Okay, so we have the motivation. We've also got the statistical analysis. So in the old days, the studies weren't that conclusive. You can look at a lot of studies from the 70s and 80s that are saying, well, money isn't really changing politics. Those were bad studies. They weren't doing them very well. More recent studies are finding more and more influence by money on policy. Okay, and so here's Bartels, who's over at Princeton, and this is his graph. He's showing how Democratic and Republican centers respond to income groups. So if you're low income, this is your response from your congressman. It's actually negative, they're against you. Okay, if you're middle income, well, you get some response. But if you're high income, you get a really good response. So this is his analysis over at Princeton. If you go over to Harvard, here's this guy who's got a number of great studies. He's really the only guy writing really Really definitive studies about the effects of contributor influence on roll call voting. So this is Clayton Peoples, and he sort of summed up a lot of his work. Yes, contributions really matter. We've really found that the money you put in changes policy. And he even did a meta-analysis where he went over everybody else's research and found that contributor money was changing policy directly happening exactly the way we think. So we have motivation, we have statistical analysis, we also have endless admissions from congressmen, mostly ex-congressmen. Once they leave the game, they can be a little bit more honest about what was happening. Some of these quotes are just mind-boggling. And this one in particular is very straightforward. Here's Bob Dole, who became one of the biggest lobbyists in the country, making millions and millions off of lobbying money. But he still gripes about the system. He still says it's not working for the common man. Here he goes. When these political action committees give money, they expect something in return other than good government. They don't expect good government and they're one-sided. Money is one-sided. And so he laments, right? He says, there aren't any poor PACs. There aren't PACs that support poor people. So you're not gonna get any governments for poor people. And again, remember, Gillen's Flatline says that as well. There's no PACs for food stamps or nutrition PACs or Medicare PACs. There's no PACs for most of the things that the average citizen is concerned about. There's PACs for oil, finance, 
so many things that we find troubling in our society. And like I said, there are endless congressmen admissions. There are books full of their admissions. So I just pulled a couple samples that I thought were kind of fun. Here's Chuck Hagel. There's no shame anymore. We've blown past ethical standards. We now play on the edge of legal standards when he's talking about campaign finance, contributor influence, and how it changes our politicians and how it changes our politics and our policy. Here's Leon Panetta, who's looking at the influence of money into campaigns and into congressmen. He calls it legalized bribery. And it's become part of this culture of how this place operates. Today's members of the House and Senate rarely legislate, they follow the money. The only place they have to turn to get this money is lobbyists, right? We have the motivation, we have the statistical analysis, we have congressmen actually admitting to this, and we have all the stuff we talked about in the 1970s, this big turn, right? We have the 1970s turning point of complexity of bills, right? Here's our cap and trade bill, which will never get passed. And I can't find more data on this, but I'm willing to guess that Ivy League students getting hired to do finance and lobbying will go all the way back to the 70s when it's down near zero, and we've seen this massive growth, right? And what are they hired for? If you get hired as a lobbyist or you get hired to work for finance, you're really hired to create all these things, the derivatives and securities and all these really outrageous things that the general public can't understand. And then you're trying to make them as confusing and complex as possible and stick them in the bills so no one will be able to follow how you're making money. Okay, so this massive increase in the ability to slip stuff into a bill and then be able to have someone pay to make sure that that bill gets voted for has changed since the 1970s because we have vote buying, because we have intimidation. Okay, so this again is our Ivy League graduates, our best and brightest are flocking to this resource. And the resource is the enormous money that's now able to control government to kick back even better returns to get the ROI. Okay, so we have congressmen who complained about it. And it's really important to look at specific congressmen who were there before the act happened, all right? So Packwood was in Congress before the 1970 act. And he has this beautiful, beautiful quote about the change of how you were able to deal with lobbyists before and what happened and how you had to deal with them after. He recalled that the 70s reforms made it far more difficult for members to vote on the merits of a bill. Most members generally wanted to do what they thought was in the national interest, the interest of the people. That wasn't always easy to do, however, but it was easier to do before the passage of the Sunshine Laws, transparency, right, which required that public business be conducted in the open. When an interest group came in before, you would say, gosh, darn, I tried to support you, I really did. The chairman bent my arm, so you can lie to them. You can say, I worked for you. You can take their money, use it for your campaign, and they will never have proof whether you voted for them or not. Never had proof that you tried to put that wording in the bill or not. Because remember, this, that the 70s didn't just change roll call voting and the ability to put names on votes. It made all these committees more open. So you have televisions coming in and watching them as they're working on the wording of a bill. You have lobbyists sitting in the room of Congress, right? You can't afford to do it. You can't go down to Washington and check everything, but the lobby are paid to be there year round, sitting behind the Congress and making sure he's doing exactly what they want. And a lot of times the lobbyists are even giving them the wording. So he would say, gosh darn, I tried to support you. I really did. The chairman bent my arm, which means I couldn't get the wording in. He's lying, right? You could lie. Then to protect yourself, you would tell the chairman that when those guys came in, the lobbyists, to tell them that you really fought hard on their issue. Take the money, let them try and be corrupt, and ignore them, right? You could play them. And this type of quote was common back then. One congressman said, hey, you just tell them I fought like a tiger for you, but it didn't happen. You have no proof. You have no receipt of your commitment. And what this does is means there's gonna be a lot less money in lobbying because there's no direct feedback loop. The lobby can't see exactly what they pay for. Really key quote, really beautiful quote. But once the lobbyists knew your every vote, they used it as ammunition, right? They can use it against you or they could use it to incentivize you. And in that same time, sort of right after these policies came through, you had congressmen trying to fight it. And some of the most beautiful bills that were passed in those years were passed because congressmen fought transparency. They fought openness. So I'm not going to read all of this stuff right here, but this stuff you really need to read. And this is about Dan Rustin Kousey, who is chairman of the House Ways and Means Commission. He argued that it was possible to pass the bill, this really important bill, 
only because he insisted on closed hearings during the markup of the bill. So he didn't allow the lobbyists in the room to watch them write the bill. It's not that you want to ignore the public. It's that you want to ignore the lobbyists because they're the ones there. It's not the public that's in there, right? It's the lobbyists, the publicists, the special interests. And indeed, once he opened the bill up, they came in droves and they went crazy, but the wording was already written. So it's important to realize it's not just the vote. The vote matters, but it's also the markup of the bill. Everything was opened up in 1970 with the Legislative Reorganization Act. So we have motivation, we have statistics, we have congressmen talking about fighting it, planning about it, trying to avoid it, right? We also have the birth of an industry. And this was a big hallelujah moment for me. I was doing some research on this, really hard to find information on this, but I did a Google search where I typed in 1973, contributor influence and legislation, and I almost fell over. The two first items that came up were two massive influential groups, right? ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, and the Heritage Foundation. And these are both right-wing. They're very hard right-wing groups, but they were both born in 1973, the year of the first electronic votes, the year when this really went crazy. January 23rd, first electronic votes being made public and the birth of these major, major groups. And this is endless, right? I've just got a few examples here, right? You got Cassidy and Associates, one of the biggest lobbying groups, 1975. What's crazy is you've got the Speaker of the House who's a member of ALEC, right? He's a member of these groups. In the old days, you had senators who were working for companies. They separated that. <laughs> The Congress is very relaxed on putting punishments on themselves, and they're the only ones who can. So Congress is a very interesting place because they can go around and tell everybody else how to act, and then they try and self-regulate. Well, there's no self-regulation here. You may disagree, but you can definitely see the influence and the years of when these things happen, and you have to really start to wonder about this subtle change, the 1970 change to increase transparency and basically open up our democracy and allow for electoral fraud inside Congress. Absolutely ridiculous. Okay, so we've got statistics, we have motivation, we have complaints, we have congressmen who said they did it, but do we have a smoking gun? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we have the smoking gun a million times over. We have actual examples of electoral fraud. And here's Boehner telling the members, leadership is watching your voting patterns. He has a lot of power. He can control whether your bill gets heard that week or even that session. And he's gonna say, I'm watching how you're voting. If you want your bill to get heard, if you want my support on your bill, you better vote the way I want on everything else. This is intimidation and can be erased with a cardboard box. This can be changed immediately. But you have every sort of example of intimidation. You have gangs forming, right? It's really hard to form a gang if you can't see how the other members of your gang are voting. All right, so it's one thing to move together and vote together and know you're voting together. You can really remain tough. But what if in that vote, you start to suspect that those guys didn't vote your way? Much harder to form these cohesive, really powerful, pushy, bullying groups. And you have congressmen complaining about the intimidation. The intimidation and pressure was intense. There are a lot of people that wanted to vote no today. And the last call, the last twisting of arms convinced the congressmen inside of Congress not to do it bullying inside of Congress. Now, you may say, okay, bullying, tough guys, all this stuff is great, and that's fine, but it's not democratic. It's no longer how we understand democracy. We want our congressmen to be able to vote their conscience, to be able to do what they think is right, and not what one person in Congress thinks what's right. That's why we have so many. We want a general idea. Okay, so we have voter fraud intimidation, but we also have massive vote by. Cover of Time magazine. This guy almost needs no introduction. Jack Abramoff, right? He had formed basically just years and years of vote buying. A congressman goes to jail. Congressmen are dropping out left and right. People were caught red-handed taking millions of dollars. And he had this special relationship with the speaker, Tom DeLay. And they basically went on record saying that exactly what Abramoff brought money to do, DeLay would make sure it happened. And he pressured people inside of the House. He would use election fraud of intimidation to pressure to get those votes inside of the House. And you had problems with Russian oil and all the things you can possibly imagine. And the story was in enormous and huge, and this guy did a lot of time in jail, and this is electoral fraud happening right inside Congress. But that's not the only story. There are so many. There's the ab scam, very famous, now made into a movie, where you have on videotape congressmen receiving money from special interest groups right on camera, okay? So you have Operation Ab Scam. 
look up Duke Cunningham. I mean, just absolutely outrageous. He basically created a menu. If you wanted specific bills passed and they were worth X amount of dollars, he would give you the price for how much it would cost to get that passed or get that vote or get his commitment on it. And then you even have right-wing groups, right? So this is not a left or right thing. Cato Institute hates this stuff. And, and they're asking, go after these guys, man. Get them for electoral fraud. Because if you don't, the buying and selling of votes will remain the engine of American politics. And so we've got election fraud, problem one, problem two, but there's also a new one, basically invented inside of Congress, and it's called log rolling. And you can just look it up in the dictionary, right? The practice of exchanging favors, in particular exchanging votes, especially in politics, by reciprocal voting for each other's proposed legislation. And one example of this is how Tip O'Neill basically turned Tufts University from just this kind of commuter university into a fine, fine university. This is in his backyard. And he would exchange votes with other communities, with other congressmen, and they would both get what they wanted. And this had nothing to do with the people's choice. This had to do with the fact that he really liked Tufts and he wanted the university in his backyard to be as strong as the other powerful university. He built this by log rolling. And there are so many examples of log rolling, it's ridiculous. Okay, so we have convictions, we have motivations, we have everything you could possibly want, but we also have examples of the secret ballot doing the work in history. And here's an historical document showing that it already cleaned up a previous Gilded Age. An 1887 study of New York politics estimated that one-fifth of the voters were bribed. Because you could get bribed because it was open voting. You could show how you voted, so it was very easy to bribe. And how easy was it? Well, electoral politics of the Gilded Age featured vote buying, the exchange of cash, food, alcohol, and other small items for votes, right? You give a guy a beer and he's going to vote for you. It's absolutely ridiculous. And this American clientelism, which is kind of a cool name, was dealt a blow by the ballot reform. A major argument in favor of introducing the secret ballot was the expectation that it would reduce vote buying. If the act of voting were performed in secret, no bribe voter could or would be trusted to carry out the bargain when left to himself. Because if you take his money and you can vote the other way, it lowers money in politics dramatically. So we have historical evidence, convictions, everything you need, and we now also have the expected end result. If you set up a system where you would open up Congress to money and money only, you would expect to get exactly this. Gillen's famous flat line. And what this line means exactly is that money has completely hijacked Congress. The average citizen has no say on policy at all. And Gillen's when he was speaking on John Stewart, said that this line got much, much worse in the last 30 to 40 years. No duh, right? We know exactly what happened. We found our lionfish, and this can be cured by a cardboard box. And as I was suggesting earlier, there were problems before 1970, and there were problems with money in campaigns. Teddy Roosevelt campaigned against campaign spending. This is because you could still get counts of votes. We saw in 1799, you would see which people voted for what. It just wasn't as common, but it was common enough that you could have vote buying. So all types of voting in the Congress, all of it needs to be put inside a cardboard box. It needs to be private. It needs to be done with a secret ballot. So even the voice votes of 1789 to 1970 should be made illegal. And as we've already discussed, congressmen don't just vote. They're in a unique position to write the bill, massive lines, thousands and thousands of lines, and then vote on the bill. Each line, each word is kind of like their individual vote. So you have congressmen who are taking funds and putting in specific lines. Jack Abramoff talks about specific lines that he was able to insert in a bill that would send millions of dollars to his client. Specific lines. You can't understand those lines unless you understand everything, if, unless you have millions of dollars to concoct these lines. You hire the Harvard kids, the Princeton guys to make those lines for you average person can't understand them, complexity is increased, but they're writing these lines, right? So they don't just vote. It's a crazy, crazy situation. They can veto bills before votes occur, and they create these bills, and each line they write is like a vote. So they're not just doing what you might expect. Ah, uh, should we do the pipeline, yes or no? They're writing the legislation around that as well. And that's all been made open since the 1970s, open committees. Another big problem of that same act passed in October of 1970. Open committees. Lobbyists sitting inside watching this. And so as we've discussed, they've opened our democracy at its most sensitive spot, right? They've basically made a lever, and here the 1970s reform are. 
creating the fulcrum for moving Congress up and down. And the elites are the people who can afford to use that lever. There's no way an average person can do this. Okay, so representative democracy, I've got nothing bad to say about it. I've spoken about it already. It's really great. Kennedy addressed the problems with that. But right now, we don't have it. Okay, this isn't representative democracy because Congress is cheap, right? There's only a few hundred of them. It's so much easier to buy the vote when you have smaller groups. Much, much harder to spend the same amount of money and get the entire population of the U.S. to sway the vote, right? It costs a lot more. You have to do a lot more advertising, a lot more attempts at bribing. And we all vote by secret ballot, so you wouldn't try and do it anyways. The person who got closest to talking about this idea, he got so close on page 171 of his 2003 book, Future Freedom, is Fareed Zakaria. Really beautiful chapter. It's chapter five of his book. Please read that chapter. He just misses because he's kind of listening to Kennedy. He really thinks that polling and opening democracy will make it more sensitive to the powers of masses. Even though he comments about this and suggests it, he really is claiming that by opening up the votes in 1970, you've made Congress more democratic, when indeed it's actually less. Money is the only influence. It has nothing to do with polling, which he talks about in his chapter. It's all money. And we know that because of Gillen's flat line, which came out in 2014. So Zakaria didn't know that. But Zakaria and none of these guys ever say secret ballot. You have to go with a secret ballot. It's a fundamental mistake. It should have been fixed in 1789. It should have been argued in 1970. It should have been brought up by someone else before, but we're doing it now. So he's this great thing talking about how individuals will never have the time or ability to monitor Congress on a day-to-day -day basis, but please read his entire chapter. Absolutely great stuff and a great reference for a lot of stuff that I did in this video. Okay, and here's just one of the bills that was passed pretty quietly, right, with a lot of push from the financial industry. And a lot of people say that the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act is the one that erased the Glass-Steagall Act and absolutely open the floodgates for the financial crisis. And this happened on my birthday in 1999, and the person who oversaw this was the last person you might think. This was Bill Clinton. So he opened the floodgates for the financial crisis. There was a lot of shadow banking that needed regulation. There was no regulation that was gonna happen because the people who were doing the shadow banking were the people who were changing congressmen's minds about whether or not to do the regulation. This can be changed by the secret ballot. So it's really important to see that just by putting a secret ballot inside the House of Representatives, inside the Senate, right? Some way for them to vote so no one else knows their vote but them, you can start to change the game on everything. Literally everything. Gillen's line will no longer, no chance of staying a flat line. It will have to start to respond to the desires of the people. And the people are very different from the elite. Okay, and I've looked a lot at how crypto can change this and crypto can change the game and how we communicate these elections and how we can prove whether someone voted or not. But you would still, even if you use crypto, any form of electronic voting, it has to be done in a private booth. It has to be secret ballots, even if it's done with crypto. You're not gonna be able to vote from your phone and consider that a free and fair election ever. Okay, so that's really it. It's really crazy to think that we can tackle all these major problems. Climate change, government spending, trust in democracy, everything by just adding something that Aristotle knew about, that first graders know about. And it doesn't have to be a cardboard box, right? Aristotle was dealing with urns and balls, any form of private ballot votes. And you don't have to search Google too long to see a lot of people claim this. A secret ballot is the cornerstone to democracy. And as my friend said, as I was going over this idea, the sooner we put this in Congress, the sooner we can start our democracy. Cheapest reform ever. <laughs> no one's ever spoken about it. I really hope that this at least convinces you to open this discussion that hasn't happened since 1789. Okay, so please remember, comment, like, subscribe, do whatever it is you do. We'll catch you at the next video.